Endgame in Last Epoch consists of three systems. The Monolith of Fate, which you can think of as mapping or rifts. Dungeons, which are more specialized and often have rewards such as boss drops. Also, the ability to create legendary items, which is super fun. And the Arena slash Arena of Champions, the endgame system that I've spent the least time playing. Each of these functions a little bit differently, and each provides its own unique rewards. So while you'll probably interact with all of them at some point, most people will spend a majority of their time in the Monolith of Fate, thus it's going to be a big focus within this video. If you did a Last Epoch and you're saying, hey, I haven't even finished the campaign, don't worry, the endgame systems are pretty self-explanatory. I'm just going to go over a few of the basics to help prime you for when you get there. But as always, feel free to come back to this video later and use it as a reference. Also, get subscribed so that you can find your way back. Maybe leave a like while you're down there. For now, let's get into things in a little bit more detail. Here we have the Monolith of Fate. You start from Fall of the Outcasts and progress all the way to the top. After unlocking Spirits of Fire, the last rune in Age of Winter, you'll be able to enter this area, which allows you to progress to Empowered Monoliths. This is Last Epoch's endgame system, where you complete a complicated echo web, choosing modifiers as you go in an attempt to push your corruption to gain more loot. Each timeline has its own exclusive rewards. In the case of Fall of the Outcasts, it's bows. And in the case of Fall of the Outcasts, for me on this character, because yes, it is character bound, I have 279 corruption. You can think of corruption as a measure of the danger and the rewards. There's a modifier down here that shows exactly how much danger there is. And well, the rewards scale up. I don't think there's a display anywhere. There's kind of a little bit here with the 200% increased item rarity, 211% increased experience gain, but that's kind of a nebulous concept. So it's a little hard to tell when that correlates to, oh, I'm going to drop something good. But hey, 200% of anything when it comes to loot has to be a plus, right? As you can see, this started right here and I explored all the way over in this direction. Now here's one really important thing about the Monolith of Fate and why defenses matter. This is an echo that I previously failed. The reward is forfeit. This is an echo that I have not yet failed, but also undead have 59% increased health and damage, so I'd have to be really careful. These are my active modifiers, and as I complete echoes, I will gain stability. Fill up the bar, challenge the boss, then use the Gaze of Orbis to fight the Shade of Orbis, who's right here, to increase my corruption. It creates bonus corruption for every Gaze, i.e. every boss. Use that to continue advancing and farming better loot. This is most of Last Epoch's endgame loot, as players will spend a lot of their time pushing corruption. If you're coming from Path of Exile, this is kind of like the mapping system. If you're coming from Torchlight Infinite, this is like the Nether Realm. If you've played Diablo 3, it's a bit similar to Greater Rifts, but with a lot more area diversity that you can actually go into and somewhat target, though enemies within the zones are kind of random. And if you've played Diablo 4, well, I guess think of this as your nightmare dungeons. Yeah, I know, there's actually dungeons in the game, but this is the primary endgame system that you'll spend most of your time interacting with as you grind loot. Now, at the end of each echo, you get a reward, which means there's definitely a very big incentive to just go through as quickly as possible, killing very few enemies along the way. On the other hand, you get bonus stability for enemies killed. So if your build can passively kill things along the way, all the better. This does kind of lead to a meta regarding speed farming. You want builds that can kill passively and go very quickly. But killing passively and going quickly isn't all there is to do, since as you push corruption, somewhat like deep delving in Path of Exile, the enemies get so dangerous that you can't just rush and go recklessly. You need to think, plan, and most importantly, use your defenses. This is why in Last Epoch, there's much less difference between a softcore build and a hardcore build. You don't get six portals in your monoliths. Die once and, well, it's pretty much all over you'll lose reward forever, and have to keep going in your progression, knowing that you failed. But monoliths aren't the only endgame system in Last Epoch, so let's get into the other two. There are currently three dungeons in Last Epoch, but who knows if more are coming in the future. We've got the Temporal Sanctum, the Lightless Arbor, and the Soulfire Bastion. Each have their own unique mechanics, and also their own unique rewards. The Soulfire Bastion is used to gamble for items. The Lightless Arbor is used to gamble for pretty much everything else, and also spend ungodly amounts of gold. 
then the temporal sanctum is used to make legendaries. Yes, that's exactly how something like this was made. In fact, that's exactly how this was made. Enter the temporal sanctum and confront Chronomancer Jewelra to forge your own legendary items. These are made by combining an exalted base and a unique that has legendary potential. But for more details about how all of that works, check out my crafting guide after this. Within the temporal sanctum itself, you'll need to swap between the current time and the ruined future. You do this not only to navigate the maze, but also to confront different enemies, because they happen to have pretty decent drops. When you finish progressing through, you'll confront the Chronomancer herself. Again, be sure to shift between different time frames to dodge her most dangerous abilities. The level of Temporal Sanctum that you need to do depends on the level requirement of the LP unique you're using to forge your Legendary. So on low level items, Temporal Sanctum 1 is totally fine. But for something rare and powerful, then you're probably going to need 2, 3, or 4. Also, Jewelra has a few unique items that she drops, and you might want to farm some of those. If that's the case, generally speaking, higher is better. But Jewelra 4 can be a little bit difficult, so for most people, you'll probably want to farm on 3 until your build can do it consistently, because it's not worth bricking keys. That said, do be sure to test T4 Jewelra, as once your build is able to do it, that's the best way to farm. When you enter the Soulfire Bastion, you'll gain a new ability. This shields you from either fire or necrotic damage, but not both. And guess what? All the enemies do fire or necrotic damage. Each time you swap, it costs one of the currency that you'll use at the end to roll for items on the Soul Gambler, so swap carefully. In fact, when I was doing this demonstration run through, I ended up exactly one currency short. So if I had swapped my shield less, I would have gotten one more item. And these items can contain valuable rewards such as LP or exalted, even sealed affixes. To go through, it's relatively simple. Clear enemies, go through the maze, and watch out for dangerous stuff. Try to pick the best rewards possible and hope that it doesn't get too dangerous. Pretty much the same as clearing the trash in any of the other dungeons. The boss fight, though, is very different because many of his attacks are wide-ranging, extremely dangerous, and basically impossible to avoid unless you're a god. But luckily, you have your shield. So if he's doing a big fire move, shield yourself from fire. If he's doing a big necrotic move, shield yourself from necrotic. This way, you'll be able to survive without having to dodge anything. Although, that said, you can dodge, and you probably should dodge at least some of the time. Out of all the dungeons, I'd say the Soulfire Bastion has the highest skill cap, and the Soul Gambler is honestly a lot more interesting than the regular gamblers and offers true endgame rewards, so it's very much worth your time to participate in this as you get the keys. On the other hand, the Lightless Arbor is a gold sink. You'll go through the dungeon, making sure to keep your light close. Every time you're hit, the light diminishes, and you'll need it to ignite the kindlings and defeat the boss at the end. While you're progressing through the areas, if you do get hit, it's not too big of a deal because you can use the nearby light elementals to restore your flame and keep progressing smoothly. After you reach the end, you'll confront the boss, a massive titan, and don't do what I do here and stand in his big slam. It didn't kill me because this happened to be a relatively low level lightless arbor, but a high level lightless arbor, that would have pretty much been instant death, even with ravenous void. So instead, do make sure to use your movement skill tactically or silver shroud to avoid damage. Destroy the debris on the left, ignite the kindling there, then destroy the debris on the right, ignite the kindling, and then destroy the titan's heart. Do this send you'll end the encounter, getting a pile of loot. But that's not really why you're beating anything here. No, 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 no. Then you have to enter the Vault of Uncertain Fate, where you get to gamble with your gold to increase the rewards. Basically, you click the button until you decide this is good enough or run out of money. Because this is a gold sink, it's probably going to be heavily utilized by Circle of Fortune members, and probably not utilized as much by Merchant's Guild. Though interestingly, if you can sell the items for more gold, it might actually be worth using it here as well, even if you are an MG member. There are also several very valuable drops from the boss, including a unique helmet and unique shield that are frequently used in builds. Then you have the Arena of Champions and Endless Arena. This is Last Epoch's competitive mode, where you get to push the leaderboards and compete against the toughest players. The Arena of Champions is a fixed number of waves, and the champion at the end has their own unique drops, whereas the Endless Arena goes until you can go no more. Now, personally, I don't really do the Arena. I haven't played a build that needs one of the champion-specific uniques, 
and I don't really like pushing leaderboards. So out of all the content, this is what I know the least about. But a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one is every few waves you'll get some loot. Do remember to break the barrels and actually pick it up rather than just going on to the next round. Number two, because the enemies keep ramping up in difficulty, the later waves are far more dangerous. And number three, much like pushing corruption, there's no real need to go super, super deep most of the time. Sure, you probably can push to a couple hundred on a lot of the good builds. And on the best builds, you can push to a thousand plus, or maybe just the cheesiest. Most of the time, you don't really need to. Although, if you want to shortcut your progress and jump to wave 100, you can use an arena key of memory. And so that's a quick overview of the endgame systems in Last Epoch, or at least the current ones. Since EHG has already announced that, alongside their cycles, they're going to be adding new content to the game in future patches, and that includes endgame updates. So stay tuned for future updates and future systems. Personally, I hope that more of the future systems are going to fall in line with the dungeons rather than the arena. Just because we already have two modes of endless scaling, and that's not really super interesting to me. But the dungeons are awesome because each has their own unique mechanics, and they feel very different from the others. And so I very much look forward to future endgame content in Last Epoch, since I do think this is one area where the game's a little light in comparison to others like Path of Exile. Now, if you're looking for something else to watch, you can check out the crafting guide I mentioned earlier, or some ways to scale your damage and defenses. I'll link to those up in the card and down below. Or you can read about various endgame activities in Last Epoch over at Maxwell GG. I also want to take a minute to thank my patrons and channel members for their continued support. For as low as $1 a month, you can make videos just like this one possible. I'd also like to give a big thanks to everyone who watched to the end. Hopefully you learned something about Last Epoch's endgame systems. Be sure to let me know which one looks the most appealing to you down in the comments below. And of course, I'll see you in the next one.